Let's take a closer look at water potential. We use this little pitchfork symbol called psi to stand for water potential, which is a measure of the free energy of a system, a water system, in relation to standard pure 100% water. And free energy, as you'll recall from physics and other things, is that energy that is available to do work to do something like moving water. In any solution, if you add solutes, you lower the free energy of the system and psi will become negative in comparison to pure water. And water moves down energy gradients, so water moves from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. The flow of water is equal to change in psi or change in water potential over resistance or difference in water potential over resistance and psi or water potential is measured in pressure units one atmosphere or one bar or 0.1 megapascals. The plant cell has a semi-permeable membrane inside a more rigid cell wall made of cellulose. So we have to consider a little bit more than just the solute concentration because the membrane itself constrains the solute movement and the cell wall is constraining the expansion of the membranes. On the bottom of this slide is a little chemical diagram of cellulose, the polymer of glucose. The plant tissue that moves water is xylem, made up of cells that are dead at maturity. And they're connected like little pieces of pipe into long pipes, picking up water from the roots, moving it into the cells. On the left of this photo, you can see the skinniest xylem elements. Those are fibers. In the middle, tracheids, and on the right, the bigger, fatter, open at the end uh, vessels. The more primitive plants have only fibers and tracheids. The more highly evolved plants also have vessel elements in angiosperms or flowering plants. We find vessels in the wood of gymnosperms, only tracheids. And it's the fibers, those long, skinniest xylem elements, not open at the ends, that are used to impart strength. And many plants have fibers that are harvested, and here's a basket made from the Brazilian palm, the burichi. So the living plant cell has water potential with different, made up of different components osmotic water potential, pressure potential, and gravity potential. The osmotic potential is that which takes into account the concentration of solutes that are in the vacuole that holds water and in the cytoplasm of the cell. The pressure potential is turgor pressure as determined by the opposing force of the strong cell wall. And gravity potential is simply the gravitational effect, which is about 0.01 negative pascals per meter above the ground. You can think about the water potential of any water-containing system, including air or soil. Something like a body of water, like a lake, has no water potential. It's totally water, although maybe it has some solutes in it. But anyway, for air, a measure of its potential is relative humidity. And that is the proportion of water in, that is in the air compared to how much the maximum it can hold. Humidity, relative humidity, is affected by temperature. The warmer it is, the more water air can hold. That's because vapor pressure the partial pressure of water vapor in air depends on temperature. And vapor density is an exponential function of temperature. So we can see that when it is 100% humidity in the air, the water potential is zero, but it increases dramatically negatively 
with decreasing humidity, 98% negative 2.7 megapascals, 95%, three percentage points less and more than double. Humidity of 50%, which is what a lot of people in other parts of the country consider comfortable, negative 93 megapascals, and very low humidity can have very negative water potential in the air. Plants have to deal with this. The differences between the water potential of the air surrounding them in their tissues and in the roots, in their roots and the soil. So the gradient usually from water potential of the leaf to the air surrounding it is great. And flow or flux, the movement of water, from plant to air is equal to the difference in water potential over resistance. The average water potential of a leaf might be 1 to 2 megapascals, or here in this diagram, negative 0.5 to negative 2.5, whereas the air at 50% relative humidity is almost negative 70 megapascals. The water potential of soil also has different components. The osmotic potential in most soils is almost zero, unless the, that soil is brackish, salty. The pressure potential is negative, and that's made up of surface tension of the interactions of the soil particles and water. And the gravity potential causing the water to drain to the soil is quite small, 0.03 megapascals. But look at this picture of a tree in moist soil. Moist soils got the water potential very, very slightly negative, almost zero. And as you go up the tree farther, the water potential is more and more negative. But compare that to the air potential, you can see why water would be drawn from the tree out to the air. Because water will move from higher potential to lower potential. So soil has water potential when it's at field capacity, and that's well hydrated, often the measure you would take in the early morning, 0.03 megapascals versus the potential of the air, it's much, much lower than that. And the plant fits in between these two differences to make the soil-plant atmosphere continuum. And this graph shows you how the soil water potential is close to zero or slightly negative. Throughout the plant it gets more negative and the atmosphere much more negative. And this, of course, is a logarithmic scale along the bottom. So in most typical plants, they're closing their stomata at night, and the plant equilibrates to the soil water potential to which the roots are exposed. So that pre-dawn water potential of the plant is about equal to the water potential of the soil. And physiological ecologists, people who measure these kind of things, get up very early so they can measure pre-dawn situations and then how things change when the sun comes up and the plant starts photosynthesizing. So what about these resistances? Where are they? Well, as you can imagine, any time water has to go through something, there are things that can impede it. The resistance of the root is affected not only by temperature, but the surface area of the root and probably whether or not it has mycorrhizae nutrients in the water that it's picking up, water, and also the membrane status. And these are all things the plant has some control over. The resistance in the stem, sometimes referred to as hydraulic conductance, is mainly a function of the vessel size or the um, xylem elements. The number of elements, the pits for lateral transport, Basically, vessel resistance is a function of the average size of the transport elements to the fourth power. So that's very big. Larger vessels have less resistance, but 
there is an upper limit on this because if they're too big, there's a much greater probability that they might collapse or have an embolism. Cavitation means collapsing with drought stress. So in leaves, we can see the importance of their structure and external morphology in their resistance because leaf resistance is the sum of resistance from the cuticle, the waxy covering on the outside of the epidermis, the resistance from the stomata, which is a function of leaf temperature, potential of the leaf, the amount of light, concentration of carbon dioxide, water vapor in the air, and also plant hormones, and the resistance of the air is affected by the size of the leaf and also the external texture, if it's hairy or whatever, that can affect the boundary layer of the leaf and how quickly wind passes over it. So transpiration is equal to water in the leaf times the quantity water in the air divided by the sum of the resistance of the air and the resistance of the stomata. And this unit is usually grams per square meter per second or moles per square meter per second. At night, when the plant equilibrates with the soil, plant cells may be nearly pure water in their vacuoles. In the daytime, when they're transpiring and photosynthesizing, of course, the water status goes down with changes in turgor pressure as water is pulled up through the plant. If the soil gets too dry and the plant loses too much water, it may wilt. It can, that's losing turgor, so some plants can wilt and recover from that. Others, if they lose their turgor for too long, may die, or they may just lose parts of themselves. So plants can adjust this process by shifting their osmotic potential regulating solute concentrations in the cells, in the vac vacuoles and cytoplasm. Or they may have leaves with stiffer cell walls. Um, remember that word sclerophylls, tough walls. Basically, in a plant, water uptake depends on the water potential difference. If a plant has a lower potential, but still some turgor, it can take up water faster. In dry places, plants have very tough leaves. And the lower uh, left is a sedum with very thick succulent leaves, tough cuticle and somewhat um, waxy epidermis that affects its reflective potential and water loss. And the upper right is a barrel-shaped cactus without leaves, or actually the leaves are modified into spines. And another way of dealing with dry times is to lose your leaves. Caducus means falling off early. So some plants in the Nolanaceae, these are ponytail trees, they grow as ornamentals here in Miami. During dry times they are leafless. And of course desert annuals spend their lives as seeds when things are dry.